alert. Civil defense information will be broadcast at 640. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Y2K, how can we prepare? Stop a few of their machines and radios. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. We are fighting for our lives. My family must survive. Boom. For five years, thousand gallons of gas, air filtration, water filtration. Coming at you from Middle Tennessee, the home of country music, the beautiful city of Nashville in Middle Tennessee, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I'm Toolman Tim. Today is March the 31st, 2024, and this is episode 439 of Workshop Radio. How is everyone out there? Happy Easter. It is the final day. This day right here used to be an absolute celebration for my wife and I because this marked the end of our snow contracts. But guess what? We've built the empire we want to live and we sold the snow business off and now March 31st is just another day. So let's open up with a rule to live by. And that is rule number 19. This is something that is probably the, my most controversial rule yet, but rule number 19, when you move on, move on. And what does that mean? Well, I think I used to catch shit from some folks because things like when I left university, four, five, six years later, some of my friends who were my best friends in university would reach out to me and like, Tim, we haven't seen you. We don't know where you are. And well, that's just kind of how you have to live life. It doesn't mean doesn't mean that you don't keep in contact with folks, but what it does mean is when it's time to move on, whether that's from a business, whether that's from an old home, whether that's from a nasty relationship or somebody who treats you shitty, simple as that. You move on without regrets because if you sit around and you look back on what could have been, what might have been, or here's the other one, the sunk cost fallacy. But I've put so much work into this. Yes, but it has now become an anchor around your neck. So rule number 19, when you move on, move on. I may not always be perfect at it, but it is definitely one of the rules that I've tried to live by. So good to see everybody in here. Let's see who we have so far. We've got Digger in here. We have Foolish Habit LG, which I think might be Pippin, but I might I might could be wrong about that. My uh, brother from down the road in Delinquents Gully, Off Grid Ping, great to see you. We had nine folks in here already for this has got to be quite possibly the oddest time I have ever run a live stream at nine o'clock central, eight o'clock, eight o'clock mountain time. Tim, what in the world are you doing on Easter morning? We're taking the girls to the zoo in just a little while. I think it's more for us than for them, but it should be a good time. We've been hanging out in uh, Nashville, spent the day up and down Broadway, uh, not on our old stud Leroy, if anybody uh, catches that very obscure reference, but we had a good time nonetheless, and then went out for Absolute authentic Tennessee barbecue last night. L2 survived. Great to see you. And I want to shout out somebody this morning who has been one of my fans since the very beginning. And that's my Uncle Paul. And I thought the world of him. He's been on my mind a lot. And I haven't heard anything yet this morning. But he, right from the very beginning, he would come in and he would message me on my review videos. And he was always a big fan. And he's been going through some serious issues. He had open heart surgery two days ago and they've been having a hell of a time getting him up out of his uh out of his um, medicine the anesthetic so that's not necessarily an out of the ordinary thing but i just wanted everybody to send their thoughts and prayers and shout outs to my uncle paul because i love the dude and he is a strong man so anyway uncle paul when you're up and around you'll get to hear this so with that guys where are we heading this morning well we uh this is the first time that i have done a mobile live stream with my new add-on monitor for the laptop which allows me to do these this week in prepping show i really couldn't do it last week simply because i need an extra monitor to bring up all of the cool articles and that sort of thing so with that here we go nothing like eating under an open sky even if it is radioactive dropping the dime on precious metals all right so this is dropping the dime on precious metals and it is one of my favorite ones i really uh, i really enjoy sharing it's just one of my hobbies and one of my passions and yeah great to see so and we also have beth emily in here great to see you 
And oh, B Man J, also great to see you. And uh, Backwoods Butcher Kyle, he definitely got my Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. For and I, <laughs> my girls and I, we love that song. And for many years, I thought it was Broadway, New York, until I realized, wait a minute, the world doesn't just revolve around New York City. There's also a Broadway in Nashville. So good to see you, folks. So here we go. This one is from CNBC. And of course, it's got my favorite, uh, well, my new favorite gold and silver dealer, and that is Costco. So here we are. Among the cans of tuna and flashlights in doomsday preppers closets, there's an increasingly popular staple, gold bars. I mean... Sure, it's increasingly popular, but I got to say, at least for most folks who have been into gold and silver for a long time or into prepping for a long time, you kind of know that precious metals are one of those things. The recent rise in value of the yellow metal is not just another chapter of favorable economic conditions for the asset. People's interest in gold and silver, too, reflect deep anxieties about our society and our future. There's some truth there. So I think what you're seeing, and I, I watch um, a couple of really good precious metals channels, and what, this this is the oddest thing, and I know you folks have seen it about Bitcoin too. When there is a when there's a market that is pushing and the price is going to all time highs, you would think that the average Joe would not want to jump in on something because it would be too expensive. However, you get that FOMO, the fear of missing out, and all of a sudden, gold and silver are through the roof. And everybody and their dog says, okay, well, guess what? I want to buy some. So what does it do? It pushes the price up just a little bit more. And I'm going to talk about B-Man J's um, comment here in just a minute. I'm going to start that so we don't miss it, guys. So people's interest in gold and silver reflects the deep anxieties about society and future. And this Timothy Morton philosopher and ecologist, a dude who I think I'd like to get on the show. I'm going to reach out to him. He wrote a book. People are looking for permanence in a crumbling world something tactile, something they can hold on to, because there's so many things that just are out of your control that every so often some people like to have something in their hands that makes them feel like they're doing something. Whether it is or whether it isn't, it becomes a, a totem of, hey, this is my little touch of control in this world. So Costco began selling one ounce gold bars for around $1,900. They sold out within, within hours. And the warehouse giant sold more than $100 million of precious metals. Now, I read a couple different articles about this one. One place said they'd made $100 million in profit, but they do not. They did not. They sold $100 million in gold the first time around. They've since gone to sleeves of uh, silver as well. But I did talk to an awesome couple at Kentucky Sustainable Living, and they said they've been having a hell of a time finding them on the American Costco site. I do know that American Costco also carries them, but... Uh, we've been picking up um, silver from them recently, so I know we've been able to get them in Canada as well. Experts say that Costco's target audience for these products likely include at least some of the same people who'd consider buying its $6,000 Doomsday Prep Kit, which comes with 600 cans of food. Now, I'm not saying that that stuff is complete total shit. I'm not. But I am saying that... Folks looking for gold and silver. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe they're just looking for a turnkey. I want to buy three pallets of Mountain House, throw it in my underground bunker, and, you know, next door to Mark Zuckerberg and call it a day. And if that's the case, okay, I'm good with that. But I'm also thinking that there's a lot more people looking for precious metals right now than are looking for a pallet of Mountain House foods, at least at Costco. Because there is way cheaper ways to put out and put up a big supply of long-term storage said lots of people are more confident that a mass a massive disaster is impending than the american prosperity will continue so in other words more people think we're going to see a long slow collapse than a long slow climb uh, to the heavens real quick said john hay editor of apocalypse in american literature and culture an associate professor of university of nevada i want to get my hands on this book it's the first i'd heard of it it is a university textbook but it's a collection of 20 to 24 essays on modern society's view of the apocalypse. It sounds like he'd be a really cool guy to interview. But really what this article comes down to is the free market being the free market. And you have Costco who all of a sudden sees, guess what, guys? I know you. there's a need out there for precious metals, gold and or silver, so we're going to sell it. So if you're looking, there's the place. But this is an article from CNBC, not just talking about 
the market prices of silver, but talking about the fact that your average Joe and your preppers, this is mainstream media once again talking about how us preppers have been driving a bit of the market for silver and gold. So I want to bring this comment up here from B-Man J. And he says, I don't trust to buy gold and silver much anymore. Too many fakes out there. Okay. I do not disagree with you. There are ways to mitigate that. And I, I know you know this, Jay, but I'm going to kind of talk about it for a minute. So when we buy our silver from Costco, we buy the, well, the last time we bought a full tube and it came sealed from the mint. I don't think there's, I, could somebody have intercepted and made a fake or a phony? Absolutely. That is always possible. But sealed tubes from the mint are a great way to go. Getting to know the folks at your local coin shop are really good. And the ones that I do purchase from, they have a really nice digital, I don't know, meter scale, whatever they put it on it and it scans it. So they're, they're really good at it. Now, is it possible that you could still get taken? Absolutely it is. But I haven't bought any silver or gold off of eBay other than a few of the zombie coins, the Zombucks that I wanted to finish my set. And to be absolutely honest, I mean, if I got taken for one of those, it wouldn't be the end of the world because they're more of a collection item to me. I don't think I'm ever going to end up trading them. So, so there's that. And if anybody else has any thoughts on it, especially anybody listening to the audio a day or two down the road, it would be great. And Gunfight says, a pocket pinger is an amazing way to test silver on the cheap. And a couple of weeks ago, we I did a whole segment on how to test gold and silver at home. None of them are foolproof, but when you bring the four or five methods together, it tends to make um, a pretty good, it gives you a fair bit of confidence. Let's leave it at that. All right. So that was dropping the dime on precious metals. Let's slide ahead from here, guys. If anyone dies while you are kept in your fallout room, move the body to another room in the house. The time has come for Stranger Than Fiction. All right, so we have Stranger Than Fiction, and this is where I take a look at, I, I try to keep the news pertinent to prepping, but every so often there's a story that just absolutely catches my eye that I'm going to throw in there. And there's one today that is loosely bit, loosely kind of tied into it, but I think you guys will enjoy it. And if you guys like these stinger transitions, I'm 99% sure that the echo is completely gone, but I cannot wait to unveil my new opening and my new uh, out, intro and outro. The intro is 99% done. Uh, an incredible lady from the community. Uh, I'm not going to give you her name yet because I got to make sure that she's cool with me promoting her. I'm sure she is, but she does incredible work. You're not going to lose any of the audio that comes with the intro, but there's going to be a really cool video built behind it. Plus a couple little additions to the audio that I think you guys will dig quite a bit. Awesome. Foolish Habit says no echo. I was pretty sure. I mean, the only thing that I'm using the same right now is my Blue Eddy microphone. Other than that, we've got a laptop in front of me and a uh, supplemental monitor off on the side. So here we go. First article, I think you guys will get a kick out of this one. ABC News. And let me preface this with, it almost seems like mainstream media will push any single protein source other than sustainably raised beef and pork and chicken. For whatever reason, they seem that they need to go on to something completely weird. And I know, you know, that kind of sells, controversy sells, but here we are. ABC News. You ready? Python farming could offer one of the most sustainable sources of meat in the world, according to a new study. Anybody out there ready to start raising pythons on their homestead? They make a decent case if you're into that sort of thing. I've, I've never eaten snake. I don't really have any interest in it. If somebody out there is looking at it, I guess it's a possibility. This is definitely, I mean, quail aren't the most normal thing in the world to raise. They, you get like, what, a handful of meat off of each one or less. So there's a place to look at this, I guess. So here we go. Python produces large slabs of white meat similar to chicken. Why is it every time they talk about some odd type of chicken, odd type of meat, they liken it to chicken? Because you have nothing else, right? <laughs> Here we are. Scientists are learning more about what sources of meat could serve as more sustainable alternatives to beef, pork, and chicken. I'm just going to back up and I'm going to be an absolute dick here. Why don't we just look at making beef, 
pork and chicken more sustainable. Instead of looking at them and saying, oh, modern agriculture has made a mess of it. Let's replace them, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Why wouldn't we just look at improving the systems we have now? But here we are, nonetheless. Python meat could offer a form of meat much less carbon intensive. There's two of your buzzwords, folks. Carbon intensive than the current options, according to researchers who studied farms in Southeast Asia for two species of python, reticulated in Burmese for 12 months. So they they did their due diligence on this. And yeah, so there we are. Just want to shout out before uh, we miss him is Jake from Ravenwood Acres. I know he is a long way from home, so he might actually be enjoying this early start show. We've got 22 folks in here. So I, I said to Becky just before we started, I said, I don't think I could have booked a live stream at a worse time than eight o'clock in the morning on Easter morning. But you know what? I think we had a really good turnout here. So it's good to see you guys. And I got you got a bunch of comments we'll go to here on the snakes in a minute because there's some good ones here, guys. <laughs> Pythons have an extreme biology and evolutionary slant toward extreme resource and energy efficiency. So those are good things. I'm not saying I am definitely not encouraging someone to go out and raise snakes. If you want to, that's great. But this is uh, interesting. These animals are extremely good converters of food and particularly protein. Literally, they are the specialists in making the most of very little. And I get that. So here's what they did. They did a study. The pythons were fed on a weekly basis a variety of locally sourced proteins, such as wild-caught rodents, fish meal, and were regularly measured and weighed over a 12-month period, period. According to the paper, the authors found that both species of python grew rapidly, putting on 46, up to 46 grams of weight per day. And for those in uh, freedom units, that would be about a tenth of a pound a day. So you're looking at adding a pound of protein every week and a half, which I don't know, that's pretty damn close to meat birds, wouldn't it be? But then again, you know, here we are. Pythons are also able to survive extreme events when supply chains get disrupted as displayed during the COVID pandemic. It can have a catastrophic impact on global livestock systems. Again, if you're building a self-reliant local system, things like <laughs> things like snakes wouldn't have to happen. Things like shortages in your feed wouldn't have to happen. If you're, you know, grass feeding your cattle, again, not nearly as big a deal. If you're being proactive in stocking up food and that kind of thing, again, you don't have to look at these odd things. These stories, you know, they definitely bring clicks in. And they kind of crack me up a little bit. But uh, in case anybody wants to know, females see higher growth rates than males. So if you are looking at getting into raising pythons for protein, oh, man, there's a patch right there. Pythons for protein. Oh, boy. Anyway, so I think that's enough of pythons for protein today, guys. But just so you know, they've moved on from bugs and now we're talking about pythons. So let's see what we got here. A whole bunch of uh, comments. This one's from the Bitcoin Viking. I repeat, my moose and deer comment. I'll take that over Python. Yes, absolutely. I'd take moose and deer over Python anyway. Beth Emily says uh, she would die of fright. I wouldn't know. Truth be told, I would too. I do not like snakes. That's one of the few things that really, there is something unholy, unnatural about the way a snake moves. I don't know why. Gunfighter Concealment says, I have tried snake. It's not bad. White meat that is tasteless unless you season it. There you go. And I'm not saying that if, you know, the shit did hit the fan that I would be opposed to eating it, but I think I would come up with some better, definitely some better sustainable things. Here, here it is right here, guys. The Bitcoin Viking says, Joel Salatin has proven sustainable beef, pork, and chicken farming is efficient. Absolutely. My friend Adam from A Modern Frontier, he's from pretty sure it's the Wisconsin area. They do grass-fed beef, and it is a fairly sustainable system in their local kind of economy. So it's definitely there. Off Grid Ping says, what, no snake farts? Yozik says, I got a pound of protein for you. <laughs> and L2 Survive says, you have to feed snakes more meat than they produce, not worth the space. That's fair. And Homestead Medical, Chuck Peoples, we'll be seeing you in less than a week. Can't wait to see you at Self-Reliance Festival. All right, let's take a look at our next story. This one comes from BBC News, so we know it's going to be good. And this one is just kind of a funny story. The headline says, man stole priceless silver after cutting hole through museum floor. It sounds like the start to a really bad 
spy novel or some sort of uh, satirical article. It's actually quite funny. So if you can see the picture, for those who are in audio only, you won't be able to. Dude literally took a hacksaw or a multi-tool or something and cut a hole through the floor in a museum about, I don't know, 8 inches by 12 inches. I don't think my old big melon would fit through there. But <laughs> so how did he get caught? Well, his DNA was found on a silver cup, which he was not able to squeeze through the gap in the floor. You ever see those videos on TikTok where they have the gold brick and somebody with a tiny hand can fit their hand through the hole and then they have to be able to pick it up and pull it out? Well, this is kind of like a real life version of that, I guess. But the dude, the dude's like, I really want that silver cup, but I'm not going to drill a bigger hole. So I'm just going to leave it behind. The theft was discovered by a volunteer who found, <laughs> who found a decorative Halloween skeleton left under the hole. So the dude not only decided he wanted to steal priceless silver heirlooms, he also had a sense of humor and left behind a decorative Halloween skeleton to scare the shit out of whoever happened to come behind him. I had to laugh. So what did he steal? Well, the dude right there definitely looks like somebody who would crawl underneath the museum drill a hole, and then attempt to steal it and also leave behind a decorative Halloween skeleton. But there was some absolute priceless heirlooms, including a Wimbledon women's single trophy. They said he snuck into the grounds of the museum in the early hours of October 29th before gaining access to the display case. He then stole artifacts, including a distinctive parcel and a rose water dish, said to be the sister piece, sorry, I misread that, the sister piece to the Wimbledon women's singles trophy. And he, <laughs> the problem is, the biggest problem, the stolen items have not been recovered and the police force believes they might have been melted down. So he got probably less than melt value for them unless he was smart enough, dumb enough to melt them down and then take them in afterwards. If he sold them to somebody ahead of time, well, you'd be uh, having a heck of a time getting anyone to give you a good price on something like that. Uh, said a 24-year-old woman and a 47-year-old man have been arrested over the case and remain under investigation. He came to our attention very soon in our investigation, and I'm pleased that we are able to conclusively link him to the offense. We do not believe he acted alone, and our investigation is continuing at pace. So probably had some sort of inside information on how to get in there. I don't know. I Anyway, <sighs> I, you guys remember George Costanza from Seinfeld? That dude would literally put in more work to not get out of to not have to do work than if he just did his job himself. I remember one time they locked him out of his office and he climbed through one of the heat vents just to get into his office so they didn't have to do anything. That's what this guy that's what a lot of these criminals remind me of. If they took 10% of the initiative they had and turned it into a side hustle or a business, Nobody would ever be able to stop them. Simple as that. But instead, they climb under museums, they end up going to jail, and they do very little with their life. It's kind of sad. Foolish Habit says, I had an employee like that. I think we've all had an employee or two like that. <laughs> oh, man. And to go back to the snake for just a minute, Gunfighter Concealment said, I, loved, I lived in Papua New Guinea for three years. Unfortunately, there's not very many things that walked or crawled on this earth that I haven't tried in that time frame. No judgment. I mean, I have tried some different food. I think I've had alligator or crocodile or something, which to some folks would be just like a Saturday dinner, but I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I've had shark. I've had raw raw scallops or scallops, as some folks would say, right out of the ocean. Those were almost sweet like a dessert. So everybody has their thing that they're going to try where they live, where they grow up, right? All right. Next article on The Stranger Than Fiction. And this was a good one. I actually had two versions of this article. And there was just too much similarity to bother sharing both of them. But I will say that there has been an influx of prepper news articles across the mainstream media recently. And this one comes from Fox Business. The question is, would you survive a doomsday scenario? Preppers offer Americans tips to weather a supply chain crisis. So this is actually a fairly positively framed article where there's some tips in here that show the average American or North American how to weather supply chain shortages again. So here we are. <laughs> Lab-grown meats, the threat of electrical grid outages, and overseas conflicts are pushing Americans to alternative food sources. Fair. Doomsday prepping was once a concept people believed was reserved for conspiracy theorists and paranoid uncles. 
But fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic is leading more and more Americans to plan ahead in the event of a future catastrophe. No matter where you come from it, the fact that more Americans are trying to be prepared for something is not a bad thing. Uh, I would hopefully, the good thing about trying to prepare or coming at these events from, you know, I, I want to be prepared for the next collapse of infrastructure, whatever that happens to be then you're prepared for a lot of things. The problem is, is that we see these, it's just like, you know, when Obama got in office and when uh, Biden, whomever, what typically when the Democrats get into office, you see a huge influx of folks going to gun, sh gun shops, gun events, or, you know, getting into prepping. And it's great. People get scared. They start spending money. The problem is, is that, or at least part of what I believe my role is in this entire process is finding folks who are coming to this because they're scared and moving them over to a passion or a purpose in their life and saying, you know what? I don't necessarily have to be sitting around worried about the end of the world all the time. I can do things that make my life more resilient. We can talk, you know, about what my wife's going to speak on in self-reliance festival about building your empire so that you have, you know, residual income coming in, that kind of stuff. When it comes down to it, that's really what it is. Getting people to step back from the edge, you know, or the ledge, depending on how you want to call it, realizing, yeah, there's not always a chance that the shit could go sideways globally, but really what ends up happening is it could go sideways personally a lot easier. And some of your planned preparations for something like that can make your life better all around. Simple as that. According to a March report, Global survival tools market is expected to reach two and a half billion dollars by 2030, growing at a compound annual rate of seven percent. Ah, survival tools, I mean, that could mean a lot of things there, but so people will ask me, What's prepping? and I go, Well, that's essentially what your grandmother did to get ready for winter. Prepper All Naturals founder Jason Nelson told Fox News Digital. I don't know if anybody out there knows Jason Nelson or not, but if you do, another. I found two or three guys putting together these articles today that I'd love to get on the show for an interview. Amid a recovering supply chain, two brewing conflicts, including nuclear powers, hackers bent on compromising electrical infrastructure, bridge collapses, that wasn't in there, but I added that, the possibility of solar flares and concerns about engineered bioweapons, Nelson says it's not unrealistic to look at the world today and say, how prepared am I to take care of my family? And that's what I like right there. That final saying, you know, whatever it takes to bring somebody to become more prepared. Once they've asked that question, how prepared am I to take care of my family? That's when you're going away from hopefully going away from fear and going into purpose. Oh, yeah. You know what? I've got five kids, a wife and uh, 10 monster chihuahuas that I need to take care of if uh, something goes wrong. You know, if, if we have whatever it happens to be and that's kind of the point, getting people to do that. Americans have this Armageddon type thing where they think that there's a secret space shuttle waiting to go get that meteor, you know? There's always an answer somewhere. Some Somebody's hidden something underground and we're good, right? We'd like to believe our big government's got a solution for everything. Well, no, I definitely wouldn't want to believe that. Nelson calculated, this is really good, that if a freezer goes out, people will only have the for three days. If the power goes out, Americans are now reduced to five days of food and has um, anyone who has generators, if the power goes out, but when people are dependent on storefronts, they will be quickly emptied out. Simple as that. Uh, anybody who doesn't have three to six months of basic staples and food within their home and an ability to grow a garden, then what's your plan? I mean, these are not weird concepts to talk about, he added. And what I really like about this is these are definitely not things. These are things that weren't necessarily talked about recently up until maybe the last three or four years, but he's not wrong. Simply put, this is exactly what I wouldn't say necessarily our grandparents at this point, but our great grandparents and our great great grandparents called, you know, a Tuesday. That's just what they did. They they filled up a pantry. They might have had, you know, an underground kind of uh, cold cellar, whatever it was, but they knew that things were fragile. And even though, you know, we had some nice new technology, like a great electrical grid and that kind of stuff coming along, they simply knew that you needed to be prepared for it because some of them lived through the Great Depression. Some of them had parents who immigrated to the U.S. or Canada and had hard times. So we do the best we can to help these folks and bring them into the prepper fold.
this one here, this is a good quote. The, the Costco prepper kits might help you survive, but we want to be the population to sir thrive. Oh boy, that's quite the term. S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-E. I bet he was really proud of himself when he came up with that. And that will require more than just a box full of pasta and beans. In the event of a supply chain crisis, people should have access to grains, preserved vegetables, but quality protein is likely to be the most challenging sustenance to acquire. 100%. I agree. But this, this is a great article. So if anybody's looking to, you know, follow up on the full version of any of these articles, they'll be in the description as well. I just kind of give you the overview of, hey, this is what I found this week that I thought is interesting, something I'd like to give my thoughts on and share, you know, my, just a little touch of stranger than fiction, because I want to tell you, the world is definitely, definitely that. All right, so that is the end of Stranger Than Fiction, and now we have our roving reporter, Willow, from Sunshine Prepper News. She's been doing a great job, and of course, this week, there was really only one story that she could talk about, and I think we all know what that was. And uh, there was a, a slight bridge collapse somewhere, if anybody happened to see it, but we will, uh, just give me a sec here, we'll get it up and playing for you. I know it's been on mute, and I've just been extra careful that you don't have to hear it in the background, so here you go. Prepper News. I'm Willow, the Sunshine Prepper, here to spread a bit of positivity on the unavoidable doom and gloom. Join me for a quick five seconds of laughter before we get into what is definitely not a laughing matter, which is precisely why I think the little endorphin hit from laughter is perfect for today. Endorphins reduce cortisol, they lower your heart rate and blood pressure, and help your muscles relax. So five seconds, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I expect by now, if you live in the USA, you know, or by now you've heard about the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsing. Let's get the basics out in the open and then ask some questions and make some observations about it all. This story is important enough that above all the other interesting things going on, like the ongoing farmer protests raging across Europe, the government, our government warning of current and imminent attacks on our water supply, or, or the troubling numbers of excess deaths, I think that... This, this whole bridge and port thing is more likely to impact you. And so I think it's something you can use as a catalyst to take action, to shore up your own personal lifeboat. Um, the water supply thing though, for real, that's possibly next week's topic. You should look into it. Okay, so the facts that we know are at about 1.30 a.m. on March 26, the MV Dolly, who was outbound headed to Sri Lanka, lost power lost control of the ship and crashed into one of the essential pylons. The Francis Scott Key Bridge is over 8,600 feet long and the giant container ship caused about 1,200 feet to collapse. From the preliminary investigations, the captains and crew did everything in their power to save the situation once the ship had lost power. They dropped anchor, they sent warning to the Department of Transportation, but at around eight and a half knots of speed, there wasn't much that could be done. So far, this wasn't a negligent captain or crew, but there aren't any clear answers out uh, yet on what caused the power outage. Some speculations are inadequate fuel supply, or sorry, fuel quality, not supply, cooling water blockage, uh, pure coincidence, accident, and potential cyber attacks or other enemy action. But based on the giant clouds of black smoke that plume out after the power outage, it leans towards a problem with the engine. The ship had been inspected regularly and only had some minor repairs. Everything was in relatively good working order. What we do know is while this horrible this is a horrible infrastructure loss. The human loss was relatively low compared to how much traffic goes across that bridge in a day. The most recent number I found is six presumed dead, which when you consider that over 30,000 vehicles use that bridge daily, think about how many cars fit in a 1,200 foot stretch during morning commuter traffic. I think the miraculously minimal human casualties play a big role in how this whole, whole situation is kind of blowing over, I think, in the mainstream news. There's a big whoop, and then people seem to not notice that a major port is shut down. Okay. Um, I do insist this <laughs> is actually a bit of a big idea. I mean, the supply chain part, the supply chain, the economic ripple effect that's going to hit a lot of people uh, in unexpected ways that comes from this. So shipping is scrambling to reroute loads, uh, but not all ports have the same equipment as the Baltimore port does for certain heavy or hazardous loads. The current Early shiny hopeful guesstimate is that the port could be open again by May. Hmm. 
Getting the port open is just the first part. Then fixing or more likely rebuilding the bridge will take years. The salvage is split into three sections. Uh, there's the ship that's grounded and very damaged from the weight of the bridge, smashing onto the bow, damaged some of the cargo. So that's one project. And then the massive chunks of concrete and steel in the harbor. That's another part of the salvage project. And then lastly, there's the sections of the bridge that are not in the water, which is overseen by the Department of Transportation. So you've got each of these three salvage areas is hiring different companies uh, to figure all this out. I'm sure they won't have any bureaucratic issues or shenanigans trying to work together to get this cleaned up quickly. It's totally going to happen by May. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, I wonder who's even liable for this debacle. I'd hate to be an insurance agent on this. The potential cost of insurance claims from the bridge collapse could be they're estimating between $1 billion and $3 billion as, and is projected to be in litigation for years. Even so, the President Biden came out and said it is his intention that the federal government will pay the entire cost of reconstructing the bridge. And he expects Congress to support his effort, supposedly, and that this will take some time. I guess I do prefer my tax dollars be used to build bridges rather than bombs, but it's just a little odd to me. I thought that was the whole reason the shipping insurance scheme existed. So why do my taxes have to cover it? And if my taxes are covering it, I get to know every detail of what happened in this investigation, right? Right? Yeah, right. Uh, one can only hope we get real answers about this someday. The idea of being able to time a cyber attack on a ship to take out a bridge seems sci-fi to me, but crazier conspiracies have been confirmed, like the whole chemtrails thing. <laughs> I hope your tin hat fits well these days. Let's wrap this up with five more seconds of laughter, perhaps at nothing and perhaps at the absurdity of the current status of our reality. <laughs> So, what can you meaningfully do if you, like myself, are not directly impacted via this by proximity? Well, let's not go hoard toilet paper. Maybe hoard a little extra sugar. There's a domino refinery near there that, I mean, they say they have a few weeks of sugar on hand, but definitely get any specialty items you've been holding out on. Um, I, for example, have been procrastinating on getting an oil filter and a spare. I mean, if it's tires or an appliance or a tool or anything not produced in America, which is sadly almost everything nowadays, consider if you should get it sooner rather than later. Shipping has been going through the ringer with the drought in the Panama Canal, missiles in the Suez Canal, and now this major port in the U.S. is down. Don't take for granted that once upon a time, we're able to easily order anything we want and have it shipped from around the world conveniently to our doorsteps. But also don't panic. The luxury of the modern supply system won't break down that easily. But above all else, do not be complacent. Take this sign that the supply chain is more fragile than most people think and do what you can to put you and your family at an advantage when things break in a way that does directly affect you. I hope you got some knowledge and motivation from today's video. Thank you for your time. Live long and prosper. Sunshine Prepper out. Boy, I don't know. It was pretty hard to miss absolutely any of the stories about that bridge collapse. Some of the footage that came out of it was almost unbelievable, to be honest. And boy, I don't know. It was uh, it was something. And it seems like no matter what story it is lately, it has been something that has affected supply chains. So let's just hope that things keep, uh, you know, chugging along, I guess. I, I, Who knows how long? Two thoughts on this. I, I lean toward it being something not intentional, simply because it happened in the middle of the night. Some people will be like, okay, well, yeah, but it still dis disrupts the, the supply chain. Yes, to an extent, but a lot of the reading I said that I did on this really didn't have it's not going to be a huge impact like some of the others. I mean, still, 30,000 vehicles a day is a big amount of traffic going through there. Anytime you have kind of a vital link like that, it's going to hurt. But we move on. We try to make sure we're stocked up for the things like she said, simple little things like sugar, like oil filters, all the rest. So, you know, hopefully the free market will do what, will, what it'll do and it will find alternative avenues to supply us, but we should never count on that. And also just the thought of Oh, the tax. I know they're not my tax dollars. I know they're your guys' tax dollars. But like she said, isn't that what insurance is for? Anyway, Willow does a great job of this. I love these segments. We actually have another segment, um, a pre-recorded mini interview 
about five minutes long later on in the show that I did, and I kind of like these quite a bit. So with that, let's slide into... He's dead. They're all dead. Everyone, you and I are in a dead world, and I'm glad it's dead. Cheap, honky-tonk of a world. Coming up next is Workshop Wasteland. All right, and Workshop Wasteland, for anybody out there who is new, is where we take a brief look at the week in post-apocalyptic and dystopian fiction, movies, books, video games, all kinds of fun things. That I, turns out two things. Number one, movies are a passion of mine and Becky, so I love to talk about them. But it also turns out that there's a ton of folks out there who love recommendations and hearing about things that are going on. Because there are times when we just need to sit down, veg out, and enjoy ourselves. And the one that I am absolutely looking forward to right now, this article comes from The Hollywood Reporter, and it is the film, the new one, coming up by Alex Garland, Civil War. They said, first reactions from the premiere, scary as hell, cautionary tale. And remember, this is a movie that is a modern day civil war within the United States where California and Texas are on the same side. So from what I've read, throw out all of your preconceived notions of what you think this movie is going to be. I'm sure there's going to be some political pandering in it, but for the most part, it sounds like it's really more about how modern media would handle something like this and the propaganda and spin that goes along with it. A24 and writer-director Alex Garland's provocative action film had its world premiere at South by Southwest. And some of the quotes that came out of there were pretty cool. There's nothing quite like it, and you're not ready, they said. A2 revealed its provocative, provocative action drama, Civil War, at the South by Southwest Film and TV Festival Thursday. This is this article's a couple of weeks ago. But here's a couple of the thoughts for you. Becky and I are going to catch it at some point while we're in the States. Uh, once she gets back down for her second trip down here, we're going to go see it. Alex Garland, Civil War is unlike anything I've ever watched. It's a big, viscous, action-packed war picture from A24. And A24 typically does very small indie horror and just independent films overall. Kind of edgy stuff. This is their first large take on a, a big budget action film. I believe it's around $80 million. I'm not sure. Civil War is phenomenal. Alex Garland's latest is a wholly consuming war movie. An epic but deeply intimate piece that uses the experience and motivations of a group of military embedded journalists to highlight the deeply chilling reality of living in a world that never learns. I like that. Alex Garland's Civil War is a masterpiece. Alex Garland's Civil War, I'm speechless, a horrific tale, a journalism tale. And there was one more quote that uh, down toward the bottom, it said, see it in the biggest, loudest theater you can see. So apparently there's a lot of big, booming explosions and folks are rather excited. The dude's put out some great movies in the past that I've really enjoyed. He was the writer of 28 Days Later, the writer and director of Ex Machina, which was a great film. And then there was the crazy sci-fi horror movie with Natalie Portman, which I'm the, the name escapes me right at the moment, but I really liked it. It was an absolute mind trip of a film. So if you're looking for something to go to the theater, I, I just, anybody who goes to see it, hope I, I kind of implore people try to keep politics out of it because I think there'll be some really good lessons to learn and it sounds like it's going to be a very entertaining movie but don't go I don't know don't go expect you it's like you know the old go woke go broke of course there's going to be some Hollywood bullshit in this movie and if you don't want to see it don't see it but I think it's going to be worth watching I will give you guys our thoughts on it once we go see it all right and the second article from this week in uh, workshop wasteland is Snowpiercer I've never watched the show. Becky and I watched the movie a few years ago. I really enjoyed it. But it's kind of a post-apocalyptic, after a really cold weather situation undertakes. And there was a TV show on TNT for three seasons. It got canceled before its fourth and final season. And AMC just picked it up. So if anybody out there is a fan of Snowpiercer, this is good news for you. The news comes 14 months after TNT decided it would not air the dystopian drama's farewell run after all. So it sounds like, in typical fashion lately, they filmed, edited, produced all of these episodes, but then didn't bother putting them out to pasture for you. Thursday's announcement confirms that AMC has acquired exclusive U.S. 
linear and streaming rights to all four seasons. The first three seasons will bow on AMC Plus later this year, and season four will follow on AMC and AMC Plus. So if you are a Snowpiercer fan, you get to rejoice this week because you're going to get to see the season four that uh, was not planned. So yeah, there you go. A really brief look at post, uh, post-apocalyptic post pop culture this week, but there's always something new. Now you stay on the back roads and you keep your gun handy. Our country is still full of thieving, murdering patriots. Get ready for I Read It on the Internet. All right, so this one is, I, I, I love the name. I, I don't get to take credit for it because some of these names for these segments came from the community. And this one came from Brian Lexovich back in the day, but it's, I read it on the internet where I go to our preppers on Reddit and I share with you the best insights, the top trending articles from the week. And this one is by Edged Blade, user Edged Blade, the coming electricity crisis in the US. The Wall Street Journal, get this, the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote an article this week regarding the coming electricity crisis. The article covers the numerous government agencies sounding the alarm on the lack of electricity generation able to meet expected demand in as early as two to five years in some parts of the country. This is a new phenomenon in the U.S. Does part of your preparing plan include this? Severe or regional disruptions likely coincide with extreme weather events. Solar panels, battery backups will cover but are expensive, and not every area is ideal for that. How does this factor into your plans? Even more concerning is that an electricity shortfall means industries will have a hard time producing goods or services people use every day. Are there other impacts that are less obvious? Like I said, this was by user Fixed Edged, and uh, Chris Dixon says new with quotation marks around it. So here's the deal, folks. This is going to be a byproduct of the push toward electrification of everything getting slightly more efficient with electricity use is not going to be the answer. We need to up generation if we are going to be able to fix this problem. And here's the deal. Wall Street Journal wrote this article. Simply put, we are going to, our uh, our need for electricity is going to exceed the input that's coming in from the grid. And it's going to be a mess. The problem is, though, that most folks... Um, they're kind of hit and miss in here. But this guy here said, my buddy's wife is a standards engineer for a utility company. Big change is going to be needed to keep up actual infrastructure investment. And they said, you can thank the R's in Congress for voting against infrastructure bills. Don't hate on me. The vote records are public. Go look it up. I mean, whatever. You know what? I'm not going to fight over it. You can You can say that the Republicans vote against infrastructure bills, or you can also say, that the Democrats push the increase in electricity. Either way, I don't care about all that. The main thing I cared about was the fact that there is going to be a coming energy crunch over the next few years, and we just need to be prepared for it. Again, I love the idea of solar. Sean Mills was by the other day to Delinquent's Gully to give me some insight. I'm going to pick up some panels and a couple things from him, but we're looking at doing some DC pumping of the water, just a bunch of things. But just be prepared for it, folks. Not anything to be scared about just something to be cognizant of and uh keep an eye on it simple as that and the second article this week from i read it on the internet is how do i start i like this and here we are i got nothing other than a usb with some emergency files medical ebooks handbooks navigation hunting basically everything and this is from user mono 699 but here's the thing They're doing two things right. They've started. They've got a USB with a bunch of backup files on it, and they're asking, how do I become more prepared? I love it. No guns or food stored. I won't get guns. They're illegal where I am. Getting a license for a rifle is very hard. Also, I have zero experience. Don't swear at me or give me a ton of down votes. (laughs) My last post sent me 120 down votes. Again, if you live somewhere where it's almost impossible to get guns, then make some other precautions. I'm I'm not going to judge you. Everybody has to live within where they live and everybody's risk tolerance is different. So yeah, I'm not going to shit on somebody for that. And somebody here said, this is one of the most helpful communities I have found. My post blew up and I got so many helpful comments. Thank you very much, which I like. I like hearing that. But so this is what a few of the folks said. And I just wanted to share, you know, things that we could share with other folks who are just getting started. I'd say the first thing you need is scenarios. What are you prepping for? Job loss, natural disaster, societal collapse. That will help you imagine what you need in that scenario. 
And I'd recommend starting with the most likely. Temporary disability from a car accident is way more likely than societal collapse. I'm really glad that user added the second part. Temporary disability from a car accident is way more likely than a societal collapse. In other words, personal apocalypse is way more likely than global apocalypse. And for those out there who are listening, they're like, I've never done this before. One of the easiest ways, one of the freest ways you can do to be prepared is to look at your area, look at your vulnerabilities in your area, look at the weather events that can happen, look at the things that can affect you personally and prep for those first. You know, a loss of a job and health. Those are the two that we can hopefully mitigate the best we can. So yes, absolutely. And uh, I like that. Somebody else added, adding to this, the threats that you will need to look out for depend a lot on where you are. For example, where I live has a low risk of wildfire, but I learned last summer that wildfires a long way away can have a huge impact on the air quality where I am. So it's important that I think about how to keep air inside my house safe. Yep, absolutely. And let's see, one more, one more. I am in Australia, no risk. uh, Oh, okay. I'm in Australia, no risk of wildfires, at least where I live. I'm mainly preparing for a nuclear war, World War III. I don't want to get into the details, but the world is falling apart. Da, 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 da. See, so I get it. It's okay. Prepare for things that are more likely. Is it likely? Sure, it's likely. But beyond that, look at the things that can absolutely affect you. So let's go back to the uh, community comments here right quick. And uh, Beth, Emily, this goes back to the, um, to the bridge collapse. But frog in the heating pot, in other words, folks are sitting around we don't really know how bad it is and we'll just kind of ignore it, you know. And Yozik says, man, I miss the echoes. For those of you out there, I, I apologize. There's no echoes in the uh, Stinger transitions anymore. How about this? L2 Survive said, I just I bought $20,000 worth of batteries and inverters. I'm still trying to find someone to install it to code so I can grid tie. I also still need a ground mount and a pallet of panels. You know what? You You know this, but that's a huge step compared to other people. And L2 Survive said, did you ever look at the 32 gig of PDF files I gave you at Thrivalist? Absolutely. Soon after I came home, I went through it all. And that was both the extent of what I did. But I was quite impressed with kind of the breadth of what was in there. And then I backed it up on my online Google Drive. And then I have it on a USB drive as well. That kind of stuff is awesome. Some of these kind of uh, massive prepper libraries. There's a lot of them out there. But I absolutely, yeah, anyway, appreciate it, L2 Survive. Okay, what do we got next? Next is Finding Freedom. And this is uh, this is kind of a fun one. It's kind of morphed over time, but here it is. These are where I find, I'm going to share some advice, no matter where I find it. And they tend to be memes because I'm a sucker for a good meme. And I'm a really sucker for a, um, you know, a motivational meme. As a, I mean, funny ones are great too, but here's one right now. This one was a quote from Karen Lamb. And it says, a year from now, you'll wish you had started today. And again, I'm going to talk about my wonderful wife who's behind this black backdrop right at the moment. A year ago, basically this week, was when she woke up from her nap in the car while I was driving and decided we were going to build our empire of daycares. A year from now, you'll wish you had started today. And a year from last year, we're happy we started a year ago. So remember, whatever you're thinking about starting, do it. Because if you don't, in a year from now, you're going to be sitting there thinking, damn it. Remember that stupid little meme that Tim shared? I really should have done it. So whatever you're thinking about, just get out there and do it. Try it. The worst you're going to do is try it and decide it's not quite for me, but you've got some experience. Simple as that. And this other one comes from this dude. He shares these on his YouTube community page all the time. His name is Steven Strangles People. He's a former MMA guy, but he puts out some of the best motivational stuff. Here's what he says. Manage your expectations. So in other words, be realistic about what you want. That doesn't mean undersell yourself. It just means know what you really want in life. These two characteristics help me a lot. Short-term urgency, long-term patience. And I'm going to agree with him there, but let's go a little further. He says, you need to take massive action in the immediate or nothing will ever get done. But it takes self-awareness to understand goals take time. Success will likely take longer than expected And finding a balance with these two concepts will save you a ton of heartache. Yes. And for me, I would say the biggest, creating short-term urgency every single day. Because the long-term things you have to do to build your empire, to build the world you want to live in, 
they're not sexy. You know, it's the superpower of doing the one or two things every day. It's the spending an hour to figure out where the hell these echoes are coming from so that I can put a better product out there for you. It's about, you know, spending four to five hours prepping for these, you know, weekly, almost weekly, this week in prepping shows for you. It's about getting better. It's about improving the audio, about improving the video, whatever it is you want to do. But in order to do that, you've got to set yourself deadlines because if you don't, it's one of those things. It's like the rental that I had to uh, renovate. I had all kinds of time in the world until I didn't. But guess what? When did I finally start really getting at it? When it had an urgent deadline, knowing that I was heading out of country for eight weeks. So there's nothing better than creating urgency for yourself to get shit done. But also the number two, the long-term patience, that's the big one. Because it's easy to be impatient wanting to see things happen in your life. But you need to know that to build something great, here's the thing. Okay, I am four years into, a little over four years into my content creation journey. I hit 14,000 subscribers yesterday, which I love. But here's the cool thing. Doing it long and slow has built a community of incredible folks who are willing to come in here and chat and carry on and to some extent support what I do. Then there's other folks who sometimes, this isn't always the case, but if you ask somebody whose channel has blown up really quick and they didn't have a time to build a community around it, it can be really difficult to find where you are. And again, I talked to a few different uh, YouTubers and content creators at the last event I was at and guys that have much larger channels don't really have a vision for it and aren't really creating or um, making a business out of it. Guys aren't really making a ton of money off of their content creation because they're just kind of there. So anyway, short-term urgency, long-term patience. Balance each other out. You're never going to find a happy medium, but do your best. And uh, Ravenwood Acres says, good for you, Tim. Must be nice. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. <laughs> And L2 Survive says, spread it around. If anybody's looking for the um, the online repository of prepper knowledge, let me know and I can sh send that along to you. Like I said, it, like he said, it's 32 gigs, so it's not tiny. All right, from there, what do we got next for you? We have this week in the workshop, and we're going to kind of go through this a little bit quick. I got a segment for you here at the end. But uh, so what have I been up to? I will... In probably Tuesday night, I imagine we'll do another Ramblings from the Road episode to kind of fill you in on more of what, because we're I'm almost two weeks into my eight-week road trip. It's going really quick, but I, uh, I recorded three interviews for the Patreon, in-person interviews at Kentucky Sustainable, which I talked about. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, I stopped in Omaha for the night. There was a lady there with a dead car battery, and I'm like, hey, don't worry, the good prepper in me can get out there and use my battery pack to boost your vehicle but i pulled it out and it wasn't fully charged because i used it before i left the house so there you go remember to charge your battery packs folks i had a great presentation at kentucky sustainable last weekend all about the poverty mindset it was actually a week ago today which is crazy where did that time go i spent two incredible nights at delinquents gully got a little bit of work done but it was just nice to to be there do some computer work haul some stuff up to the cabin pick up some lumber and I spent the one night in there where we got two inches of rain. So it was good to see where the water was coming in, where it wasn't. And I stayed relatively dry. So I was good with that. I also brought my, my get home bag, which I'm going to do a whole video on. But I've been using all the gear out of that at Delinquents Gully. Because, you know, it's all great to have a bag with a bunch of gear in it. But if you're not testing it out and practicing with it, again, kind of a fake prepper. And I figured I better fix that up so i've been re the thing i've been really enjoying is the jet boil stove that thing is a piece of work i gotta tell you becky speaking at self-reliance festival we'll talk about that more but i'm excited basically her concept is creating an empire out of the chaos of life and she's gonna without giving a whole lot away she's gonna get um pretty open about some of the things that have happened to her in the past and uh, so i hope all you ladies and gentlemen out there come to hear her because i know damn well that i'll be front row and center cheering her on so i picked up the ladies my beautiful wife and my daughters at the nashville airport the other day we've been touristing around the city for the last few days it was, it's been a lot of fun uh, what else sean and don came out to uh, sean and don and their daughter sean mills from hack my homestead they came out and brought me um some 
high quality Colombian coffee. We had a great morning visit. Sean took some measurements for solar panels and a DC pump, that kind of stuff. And our friends, Kathy and Chris came down from Ontario to meet up with us here. This is where friends, this is, this is what friends are. Uh, that Kathy was friends with Becky right back to high school. At least they were friends for a long time. The last time we hung out with these guys, Alice and Charlotte were newborns. They were still in diapers and in carry car seats. So that tells you how long it's been since we've seen these good friends of ours. And guess what? They were crazy enough to hop into their vehicle in Ontario, drive down to meet us in Nashville. And we've been running around. We went on a riverboat cruise with them two days ago. We spent the whole day running around Broadway in Nashville. Had some, oh, we've been eating. Oh boy, we have been eating pretty good. We, <laughs> we went to... Uh, Tennessee barbecue last night. Today we're going to the zoo. It's going to be awesome. So it's been great to have them. They're going to come down, I believe, to Camden for a day or so just to see our property. And yeah, it's crazy how folks you haven't seen in 15 years, you can uh, meet up with them and, and just kind of hit it off again. So there you go. It's been good to see you, Chris and Kathy, in case you happen to see this episode. Uh, Starlink has been working great out at the Lincoln's Gully. I honestly wish I could use Starlink in my hotel rooms, but instead I use uh, the hotspot because if anything I've noticed this year and last, Wi-Fi at hotels is getting worse and worse and worse to the point where it's almost unstreamable. So there you go. I brought two solar power stations, whatever you want to call them. The 800 watt Blue Eddy works great, but it's underpowered for running Starlink for any length of time. And then I've got the Anchor, which is around 1,000 watts, and that thing is awesome. Basically... I would say at least two full days I could run Starlink, maybe three if I was careful. So that's what we're going to tie in some of these solar panels and stuff to. Uh, the battery mug that Becky got me, definitely overpriced for what it does. I basically got two mugs of coffee out of it. And honestly, I think the thickness of the mug and the lid do more than the battery powered bit. Uh, I mentioned the jet boil stove is awesome. We went on a riverboat cruise, had a ton of fun for that. I did mention the new video intro coming for the channel. Also going to be exciting. I cannot wait to show you that. You know what? Yozik's probably right. Maybe it's just because he says Wi-Fi at hotels was never good. And you're not wrong. I think I'm just trying to do too much through it. But I do. A, I did a, a speed test of the Wi-Fi before here, and it was less than four megs per second. And when you log into StreamYard, it has got to the, you know, I would have, it gives you three bars for Wi-Fi, and I was down to zero. <laughs> but on 5G now, I can stream like nobody's business. And I have unlimited internet now through the U.S. So it's just way easier to hook up through my phone. It's crazy the technology we can do. It's crazy that I was able to sit at Delinquent's Gully the other day and do an almost perfect live stream with something that would fit in, man, I don't know, just a little tiny box. I mean, I can carry it. I could put it in a suitcase and carry it under my shoulder and I can have basically high-speed internet faster than a lot of things I have just about anywhere. So there you go. And finally, um, I haven't had, I, I decided not to put out any new review videos, at least for a couple of weeks while I'm on the road, because what I found was the ones I put out in a rush last year, the quality was just poor. So I've stuck to getting you guys out the live streams. And for those on Patreon, I just uploaded a full 23 minute video of an interview I did with Paul Wheaton last May at Thrivalist Fair in Addy, Washington. And so what I'm going to do going forward now is I'm going to end up sharing five, about a five, I'm going to put a five minute clip up for folks so that they can get a feel for what these interviews are, because I want, I'm a big fan of value for value exchange. So, you know, if you like the patches, subscribe to the patches, you'll get a patch every month for 10 bucks and it helps support what I do. And if you like the idea of getting exclusive interviews for with, I think, some top name folks in the preparedness, homesteading, permaculture sphere, and I got a ton in the bag, then $5 a month for Patreon is a good deal. And there's also, Carrie Brown was the first one to sign up. I got the $15 a month Patreon that uh, does both the patches and the Patreon. So there's that. But anyway, so all that to be said... What I wanted to share with you today was the five-minute interview that I did with uh, Paul Wheaton. So here it is, guys. Hang in there. It's uh, it's quite fun. I enjoyed it. Make sure we get uh, 
all the audio working for you. Here you go. I've got, who do I have with me? Uh, my name is Paul. Paul. Paul, who would you be, sir? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> some call me the Duke of Permaculture. I like I like what they did on this vent where they, they put it up to think about the bad boy of permaculture. Is that new? So when did you go from being the Duke to the bad boy of permaculture? I think they both happened about the same time. Uh, that, uh, it was probably about 10 years ago. Yeah, in fact, it was a little over 10 years ago that Occupy Monsanto called me the bad boy of permaculture. What was your job in high school, too? Ha! <laughs> wow. Well, I remember when I was 11, I would buck bales uh, and feed cattle. I got paid, like, I think 18 cents a bale, and I'd move. Pipe, irrigation pipe. You like I got that? paid a dime a pipe. So did you do more because of that or less? I don't know. I was <laughs> glad to get the money though because boy, I had some sort of pop addictions. What was your favorite and, pop back in the day? Oh, sweet cold Pepsi Cola. <laughs> For some reason, I've been really interested in the, the early internet as well. And <laughs> when I was, reading, I was there, you were. You you played a part in the early BBS system, didn't you? How did that come about? I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this, so I want to dig oh, in. Oh, I've managed some online communities during the BBS days. Do you remember the names of any of them? I remember I had one in Missoula that I called the Missoula Area Conferencing System. I had 12 phone lines coming into my house. And, uh, and then when that folded up, because I tried to do it as a charge thing, I couldn't quite get it off the ground. So it's kind of like it's kind of like trying to do the internet before the internet was popular. Sure. Yeah. But one of the things I found real frustrating was um, trying to get people online because they would use a software called Procom back then. Sure. Yeah. And you could easily configure that so it couldn't work. <laughs> and there were 50 different packages, and Procom was the best, and the rest of them were worse than that. And um, so then it was like, okay, I got to get a job again. I got to go back into software engineering. Okay. And so um, I have a lot of skills at telecommunications, at that kind of thing, getting getting a computer to talk to a modem kind of stuff. Sure. So uh, I decided to make some software just real quick, like on a weekend. I threw together some software. I put it up on CompuServe. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And um, uh, I was like in business overnight. Nope, like no, it got, it ended day. up getting downloaded more than Procom and all the others combined. I was just super famous all of a sudden. I wrote BananaCom. So how did how did Paul Wheaton, the IT guy, go from the bad boy of permaculture? That there was that summer when BananaCom was really taken off, and I just couldn't spend time with BananaCom because I became obsessed with gardening. Why? Because the year before, I threw some seeds down and almost everything died. And so I don't know, I just kind of got this bee in my bonnet, and I read more than a hundred gardening books. I got a pile from the library. Okay. I, I went, the Missoula Public Library is amazing, but I went and I probably got 20 books, okay. and I just took them all home and I poured through them all, and when I got through all the books at the library, then I went to Barnes & Noble, which was brand new in town then, and I'd sit in their big comfy chairs and read the gardening books that the library didn't have. So here we are yes. at an event in central Washington. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. in eastern Washington, on Mount Spokane, I own 80 acres. Okay. And um, I was doing all these experiments. I just was obsessed with experiments. And um, and there was a fella came by, and he said, what are you doing? And I explained to him all my different experiments that I was doing. And, okay. and he said, well, that's permaculture. And I, I said, say that word again. And then uh, and he says, well, I got a book. So he had Mollison's big black book. Sure. And his copy smelled like mold. He it's like it had mildew all around. And it's like you turn the page and it's like, oh, oh, it stinks so bad. But I gotta read it. And sure enough, like half the stuff that I thought I'd invented was already in here. What is one thing using permaculture that if everybody in the world did it, it would make the world a better place? Gardening. One one third of your carbon footprint, half of your petroleum footprint, 
uh, is food. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for doing this. This is hard. It, it, it There's is. some people doing some magnificent stuff, and no one will know because they don't record anything. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. That's just a little taste of what I try to bring to you guys. I love doing these interviews and after a long conversation with a good buddy of mine, Sean Mills, he said, you know what? These need to be, these are something special. They need to be somewhere that folks can access them, but you can get some support from them. So, so far we have done, we've got John Pugliano, we have Paul Wheaton, we have Joel Salatin. How about some of the ones coming up? We got Sam from Slave to Servant. We have Jack Spierko. We have William Bond. We have the Angry Prepper. We have Angry American. I've got one with Nicole Sauce. I've got one with Mike Shelby. Oh, there! I, I right now probably have about 15 of these interviews. I've got enough to get me through for my next road trip, and I plan on recording a bunch more for you. But Really what it is, is a really cool way to get insight into what some of these folks are doing because, and I got a couple of one question here, one uh, comment I want to bring up and uh, it's from L2 survive. And he said, I'd really like to see a video of the programs and gear you use for your live streams, maybe a how to as well. It might also prompt people into a side business making videos. 100% I will do that. I've, it, it's one of those things that you start, you do it. I started recording these interviews, for instance, and didn't even know what or how I was going to release them. I just knew I wanted to collect these awesome in-person interviews for you. And guess what? Paul's was the last one I did with a single microphone. I realized that I could upgrade my Rode Wireless 2 gear to get two microphones, and now I can put them up at my neck and up at the other speaker's neck, and it gets rid of all of that nasty background noise. I'm also much more particular about where I'm going to share uh, where I'm going to record from as well because again you learn as you go it's still a great interview with Paul and if you want to see the full 23 minutes grab the patreon link from the description you can subscribe for five bucks you can cancel after you watch the video if you want but I think it's a great value Alice and I at times are also doing some videos of MRE testing and some uh, we, we went to a Chinese grocery store picked up a bunch of interesting proteins there so anyway Enough of that, but I wanted folks to get a real taste for some of these interviews, so I hope that five-minute uh, adds to these episodes. And finally, we're going to finish up here with the, what do we have left for you? It's the apocalypse, end of days, the judgment day, the end of the world, my friend. Let's dig into the community mailbag. So we have the community mailbag for you, and this is where I take a dive into some of the stuff that came along from the community in the last, well, in this case, two weeks. So we're gonna we're just gonna grab a couple of interesting things that you saw. So this one comes from our good friend, the Philippine Nomad, and it was in response to my poverty mindset presentation at Kentucky Sustainable Living. And he said, for everyone, for anyone that has planted something, when someone comes up and approaches you or your group, spreading that poverty, scarcity, gloomy type mindset, step back and tell them bad seed bad seed then walk away i love that it made me laugh to no end because that's exactly it run in the other direction for sure okay this one came from one of the ones i did i believe this is the the live stream i did from delinquents gully this was from claiming liberty they said i had to laugh listening to this video when you were talking about your water filter i kept hearing you say braille and wondering why you were talking about accessibility stuff on your podcast. Close, it was Grail, but it's spelled G-R-A-Y-L, and it is an awesome water filter. I'll definitely do a follow-up on that one. You'll get to see it. And then I mentioned to you guys, well, what I thought was called Cairo, Tennessee. It looks like it may be Cairo, actually, but it's spelled just like Cairo in Egypt. And this one here said, uh, this came from Churn Dash Farm. They said, Google says Cairo is abandoned. And truth be told, it's not quite abandoned, but it is really close. And I've talked about it. I really wouldn't mind snapping a few photos there someday just to kind of show you. It's not abandoned, but it's gone from a population high of 16,000 to less than 1,000 today. The place is absolutely dilapidated. It's worth checking out, though. Just drive by to see it. It's quite an experience, but it might as well be. And today's content creator kind of spotlight 
we're going to talk about Cairo just a little bit more. This one was a question from Jason Lacomp, and he said, this is about hooking up natural gas to your generator. <laughs> this is an odd one. I wanted to share it. Great video. Can you explain why people are against using a heavy duty garden hose for natural gas? I have one cut to length that I need. Besides leaks that I think I can prevent, is there any other reason I shouldn't use it? Because I don't think the PSI is high enough to burst. I almost laughed at that at first thinking that seems really scary and really sketchy. And then I, you know, I got thinking, okay, well, the hose that I hook up to my barbecue is just a flexible rubber hose, albeit a better one. I'm not suggesting you go out and use a garden hose. I am definitely still going to recommend using a store-bought designed for natural gas. But I had to type this into Google and see what I found. And I found an old school forum from about 10 years ago. And here's some thoughts that some of these folks had. They said, back in the day, I worked on a firm that had free lease gas. And that tends to be from oil leases uh, from the farm wells. And we used old garden hoses to run all the gas throughout the greenhouses for the open flame heaters. We had a link once in a while, but never exploded. Again, just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it can't. If you think about it, they've been using rubber fuel lines and gasoline powered automobiles for decades at higher pressures than natural gas will ever reach. Most new underground NG is run with um, PE. I think that's the plastic stuff with stab fittings. This isn't really that crazy. So again, um, could it be done in a pinch? I think it could be. Should it be? No, I'm still going to recommend using <laughs> the proper stuff. This one here said, my dear old dad told us he used to see cars with rubber bladders inflated with coal gas tied onto the roof or in the trunk of cars during World War II in England. Gas was not restricted, but you had to have coupons to get petrol. But there were some that popped up, and one can imagine that garden hose were handy for fill-ups. Again, that's very similar to the gentleman I had on a while ago that talked about wood gas fires. They did it. They put it into balloons. I know. This guy here said, I think in the 50s, I often saw stoves that I presume was pieces of garden hose. And in those days in Toronto, they had sour natural gas. So I'm not saying do it, but here's my thoughts. I said, I think the issue isn't really with the pressure or even the leaks. I think it's mostly a non-durability. The hose can melt, it can cut, it can burn away faster and easier than typical natural gas. And if you happen to cut into some of those natural gas hoses, because I did, I accidentally hit one of those flexible ones with my snowblower one day, and you will see that there is reinforced wire mesh in there as well. So dude, like I just can't, I know times are tough sometimes. I just can't see using a garden hose to pump natural gas through. Save up a little bit and buy a purpose-built hose. That's all I got to say about that. And then this one here, I thought you guys would absolutely get a kick out of. I never noticed it before. It was from my video, DeWalt Battery Lawnmower, was it worth it two years later? And somebody says, so we're not gonna talk about his dog totally getting beamed out by aliens. The dog's there at 251 and the dog's gone at 252. I laughed. I showed Becky. She's still laughing there, too. It was so friggin' funny because sometimes stupid Dee Dee. She, so fat old Dee Dee, number one, I think they'd need two tractor beams to pick her up. But number two, I'm just editing away on this video. It's up there. I never noticed that poor Dee Dee walks into the frame and then I must cut out like three seconds of silence and then she just disappears. <laughs> so if you ever want to... It, she's safe. She is safe. Becky says behind me that she's 100% safe. She didn't go on aliens. Even if they did take her, they would have sent her back way too quick because she would eat too much and she'd whine too much. But it, it cracked me up. If you're not sure if there's something in a video, man, I want to tell you, the community will find it day in and day out. And I love it. So uh, thanks to that was Van L. Hill. Not sure who they were, but uh, it was awesome. Yeah, it, what a great laugh. So L2 survived. Great to see you. Uh, always great to have you in here. So finally, guys, what I end up having for you uh, this week for a content creator spotlight, that's usually the uh, one that I like to do here. This one was, let me show you, it is What Happened to Cairo, Illinois. And there was a person, and I didn't write their name down, in the Telegram group just the other day who said, I heard you talk about Cairo, and I was kind of curious myself. And this is a three-minute, one-second video that explains basically why the city, or what was a city and is now barely even a town, absolutely collapsed. So if you want to give, if, if you're interested in that kind of thing, this YouTube channel is called Forgotten Places. They got 56,400 subscribers. The link for the video is in the description below. 
And guys, that honestly is what I brought for you today. I know it's just a, well, I was going to say about a slightly bit shorter, but we came in at just under an hour and 20 minutes and it was good to get back on here with you. These are my absolute, I don't know, I say my favorite show to do. I love doing this week in prepping, but I also absolutely love doing interviews. And the longer I've been down here, the more I've been thinking about just wanting to get some awesome interviews knocked out for you. So anytime you guys have a suggestion for somebody you'd like to have on the show, or if you'd like to be on the show, just email me at therealtimcook at gmail.com. When I get back, I was going to say stateside. No, I, I don't know. What, what the hell do you call it? When I go back to the People's Republic of Kanakistan, I will be putting together a full slate of interviews going forward every week and maybe even two of some because I've got so many good folks that either reach out to me or I've been kind of introduced to via another friend, you know, a friend of a friend type thing. So anyway, guys, with that, we're going to get ready. We're going to go have a great day at the Nashville Zoo, and I'll bet we'll do a little bit of shopping. But most importantly, we have built the life we want to live so that we can travel around. I can come around and speak. I can live stream on a Sunday morning from a hotel. I can share my message with you guys. Hopefully you can take it, share it out with the rest of you. And then when I'm done, we get to go out, run around and play tourist in Nashville and then travel to our land in Tennessee. So remember guys, that honestly, 100% entrepreneurship. That's where you find your self-reliance, your resiliency. That's where we help insulate ourselves against you know, collapsing economies, and you know collapsing infrastructure literally and figuratively so with that folks you know i love you it's great getting back on here i know it's been a few days we'll have a couple episodes we got self-reliance festival coming up and then i have two full weeks working on delinquents gully cannot wait and with that as always stay happy stay healthy and have a great 